Tate Chronicles now transmitting. Welcome to the Tate Chronicles on Healthcare Now Radio. And now, here's your host, Jim Tate. Good day, citizens of the free world, from border to border, coast to coast, and to all the ships at sea, I bring you a warm welcome. This is your correspondent, Jim Tate, and thank you for tuning in today to the Tate Chronicles. Join me as we cut through the fog that exists at the leading edge of healthcare, delivery, and technology. Particularly today, the fog that exists at the leading edge of healthcare equity. I'm really pleased today. My guest is a longtime friend, Amit Trevetti. Amit is the Director of Informatics and Health IT Standards at the Healthcare Information and Management System Society, better known as HIMSS. He's responsible for directing the ecosystem of health IT standards for HIMSS. I've known him quite some time as he's been involved in healthcare information technology for over 15 years. Amit, welcome to the Tate Chronicles. Hello, Jim. Uh, thank you for having me on the program and pulling me out of my standards dungeon to talk <laughs> about health equity and health IT and some ex- you know exciting topics today. Yeah, it really is. Um, and that, as as we mentioned, the topic for today is one that I've wanted to discuss for quite some time, and that is the issue of healthcare equity, which is frequently defined as everyone having the opportunity to attain their highest level of health. And this covers many issues related to healthcare disparities, such as uh, basic access issues, the funding of clinical research, many other barriers. But Amit, with your help, I would like today to take a stab at one aspect of this crisis, which is known as the digital divide and how it affects disparities in care. And let me give a definition here first. Digital inequity as a general term, refers to the economic, educational, and socio-cultural disparities that arise from inadequate access to and utilization of technology. In this case, what I'm going to ask you to kick us off with is, what is the digital divide in healthcare? How do you define that? Well, you know, there's there's a number of things there, and uh, it, it really starts with, you know, the broader concept of the haves and the have-nots, and, and you can see it throughout healthcare, throughout, you know, uh, many different uh, aspects of uh, the technology lens, but, uh, you know, I think when we, when it comes to healthcare, we're always looking at what are the factors that improve or affect healthy lives and health outcomes. And so, of course, one of the big topics in healthcare today is the social determinants of health. What are those other factors um, that, that contribute to, to healthiness? And, and one of the things that we've realized is a part of that social determinant of health is access to technology, access to broadband, access to the devices that support telehealth, interoperability, and unlocking the access to um, improved healthcare via health IT. And so in terms of the types of um, the social determinants um, that affect healthcare, they also affect how health IT is implemented and used. And so this, this means we're talking about things like digital and health literacy. We're talking about internet and broadband access. We're talking about IT support and assistance uh, to uh, obtain that ex- accessibility. And then, of course, overcoming the weariness or um, distrust or even uncertainty of using new technologies. All of these things affect health IT implementation when we're talking about patients who can make use of new and innovative health IT um, technology and tools. And these also affect the social determinants of health and health outcomes. You know, uh, as you covered that, I mean, one thing that strikes me is as healthcare technology and use cases advance, whether it's remote patient monitoring, uh, telehealth, devices that people get where uh, that report data back to providers, uh, all those kind of things. As that leading edge advances, folks that aren't able to utilize it for quite a few number of reasons, they lag even further behind. The digital divide seems to be getting wider. Is that is that your thought on it also? 
you know, it, it's hard not to see that, you know, and, and uh, I think one of the, the biggest examples of that is, you know, the current COVID emergency, public health emergency, global emergency, and, you know, how we've reacted, how we've responded, and how it's affected our communities. Um, you can see a growing divide in, in um, health outcomes and how folks are, are, are reacting and responding to this health crisis. And often we see while technology can be introduced and help uh, and can help and assist uh, improving health outcomes. Uh, technology can also increase the, that, that divide, the, the difference between the health uh, haves and have nots. And, and just a quick example, right? Um, vaccine credentials. Um, this is a, a very, uh, so it's, it can be a controversial topic because not only is it related to mobility of uh, individuals and access to events and organ um, and uh, activities, but it also is related to individual privacies and the technologies folks use to um, transmit or leverage those kinds of credentials. And so what I'm getting at is um, many vaccine credentials are supported by smartphones. And so depending on uh, an individual's access or ability to have a, a smartphone, uh, that can uh, affect their ability to have access into the broader world in terms of where folks are able to enter or freely move uh, when vaccine credentials and things like that are required to, in order to preserve some um, population health and safety. Well, and uh, um, also the issues of patient-generated data, uh, f folks that have these uh, uh, devices they put on their arm to track their uh, uh, blood sugar levels because they may be diabetic, and it generates data that goes to their smartphone and develops a graph and sends that to providers. That's all wonderful, uh, but everybody doesn't have access to that technology. So that, that really spreads out the divide ev even more where the development is taking place for those type of devices. Exactly. And, and you, you know, it's there's so many different foundational components to this. So one, the technology, the device itself, um, often expensive um, and out of reach. Then we're talking about the IT infrastructure and uh, the broadband access. And, and we know that there's a huge digital divide when it comes to urban, rural, regional geographics and, and disparities. So again, if we're thinking about rural broadband, we already know there's there's an issue there and there's challenges in, in that last mile connectivity. Those are the folks that could use telehealth. Those are the folks that could have the immediate promise of um, that health IT can unlock, but those are the folks that are probably least able to take mm -hmm. advantage of it. Mm -hmm. and, and that really gets to that concept of equitable interoperability. Well, I'm glad you brought that term, equitable interoperability. Do you have a less than a three page definition of that for us? Equitable interoperability? Well, um, I'm going to avoid the yeah. actual definition just Good. because, uh, you know, we would want that to be standardized. But right. that said, let me break out the concept a little bit more. And, right. and it's uh, expanding upon the idea of um, interoperability should be equitable and it should be achievable by everyone. And often the interoperability that we're developing or promising is only available to the folks that are at um, one end of this equity graph. You need to have the access to those leading institutions, the academic medical centers, the large health systems. You need access to the devices. You need access to those leading edge providers. You need access to the broadband to be able to really access that interoperable um, health care and um, ensure that that you can have the same benefits that other folks do and and let me go a little bit further too so that that equitable interoperability is not just about devices and broadband but it reaches all the way down to the granular data that we're storing collecting and hopefully protecting because one big part of equi equitable interoperability is the ability to protect you and use um, the data that's collected for the right purposes. And what I'm getting at here is the granular protection of, of uh, 
uh, health data. And uh, just to, to expand upon this a little bit more, um, one thing that we found as we've uh, you know worked with our different uh, communities uh, engaging in interoperability exchange is that when you have a patient health record and when it has sensitive data, that data, we don't have the ability to um, protect that data at the granular level. Um, we're still trying to figure out how and when to redact that data, when that's appropriate. Um, and then who should be able to do that? Is that the patient? Is that the provider? And so when we do not have these capabilities, we risk, um, we risk two things. One, that that information gets out when it shouldn't, but even just as concerning, that that information is just withheld because it's too complex to share the data. And so this is, a, this is an actual and ongoing issue in that health systems that do not have th these capabilities by default sometimes do not share the data of sensitive uh, health records. And so if you think about the folks that may have a complicated health record or a complex record with sensitive information, this could be substance abuse information. This could mm -hmm. be mental health in information. Mm -hmm. This could be domestic, um, um, their domestic situation. All kinds of this stuff could be in considered sensitive this could all result in health information being withheld from other providers. And so these patients, the ones who could, who need more help, who need the specialists, who need that information to be uh, transmitted to folks are the ones who are, are left out. And so again, this, this contributes to those inequities and those disparities. And, and we know that um, this often affects folks at the lower socioeconomic brackets. You know, you, you mentioned the, um, the, the, that sensitive data. And there's also the data that's the uh, social determinants of health. And often uh, that uh, the issues and information around social determinants of health is more important or as much as important as having a list of somebody's uh, diagnoses. But that data, there are no diagnostic diagnostic codes I'm aware of or, or, or risk-related codes to those uh, social determinant um, uh, d data elements. They're often buried uh, in free form as text in, in, in notes. And so that re really critically important data is really never becomes part of any interoperability schema at all. And, and you know, you're, you're hitting upon a, a huge topic here too, right? Um, for interoperability today, it's not just about being able to capture that data. It's about being able to capture and use that data. And so what's the, the most important data that folks are looking at today now? It's, it's the social determinants of health. Yeah. And, and for folks who, who are, are not familiar with that, um, social determinants of health are conditions that describe the places where people live, where they learn, work, um, where they age. And all these factors affect a huge range of health um, and quality of life outcomes. And um, there's plenty of data out there that's found that SDOH factors account for 80 to 90% of a person's health status. And then these factors are, are huge contributors to things like premature death, yet these factors are, are huge when we start looking at preventable disparities in health status and disease outcomes across the population. And so this information folks have realized is critical. And this information is also sensitive. We're talking about food insecurity, transportation insecurity, um, domestic violence. And so often this information is being collected on paper. Um, you mentioned that there weren't the associated codes. I talked about the, the lack of uh, the ability to protect granular data. So some of the most important information that we need to determine health outcomes and quality of life is being collected in a way that um, we don't have the, the, the full standards for, we don't have the privacy protections for, yet, uh, the industry knows that this is the important stuff. And if you look at the health IT industry in general, um, 
folks are, 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 are looking at sucking up as much data as they can for analysis, for AI, for machine learning, for predictive models, all kinds of things. But are we making sure that we're protecting that data for our patients? You know, I know there is a organization or it's a national uh, public collaborative uh, organization called the Gravity Project. And I think they've been working since 2017 to try and create codes for these SDOH factors to make that data available. So uh, research can be done. So uh, proper monitoring of potential healthcare issues or actual healthcare issues, uh, you know, that data that is essentially underneath a digital radar, um, it's like diamonds and jewels down there. Uh, and it's not being brought to the surface. Uh, so, yeah, there's a giant gap right there. There is a giant gap, and I'm quite familiar with Gravity Project. We, I work mm. very closely with them at HIMSS, um, also in my other standards work with IHE USA and IHE International. And in fact, we have a um, session at the end of the month where we're going to be supporting uh, folks that are trying to pilot some of the Gravity Project implementation guides. Wow. And, you know, we've talked about equity and disparities, um, and, you know, one of the places where I see it the most is in the funding and the support for interoperability and standards projects, um, especially as they relate to uh, modernizing and improving our public health infrastructure. Um, I can't imagine a time when we could use that infrastructure more than today, but that entire area, in my opinion, remains criminally underfunded. Public health, um, things like the Gravity Project, which, which is an amazing um, bunch of work done by great people. And if you can't hear it in my voice, um, Jim and I already talked about a little bit about yeah. mm -hmm. how we both get excited when we have the opportunity to intersect, you know, advocacy with our with our day jobs. And so my day job is standards development, adoption, implementation. But what I'm passionate about is making this stuff work for patients, and especially, um, hopefully, before I retire, <laughs> because um, I used to be one of the young folks in in these standards groups, and we thought we'd have it solved. And uh, today, we're, we're still finding out that so much work needs to be done at the foundational level. And one basic thing that needs to happen is automating and standardizing the collection of race, ethnicity, language data, and then protecting data at that granular level. Well, you, you know, the things you were, uh, are, are talking about, um, I mean, we, we saw this on our televisions and on data sheets over two and a half years during the COVID-19 crisis worldwide, or just, or just here in the United States. Um, who, who was getting tested? Who was getting treatment? I mean, it really kind of continues. Um, I know one of the uh, best places to look at that data um, is, I think it may have been put together by Google Health, but it's it's uh, healthequitytracker.org. And it accumulates a lot of data uh, and shows you who was able to get tested, who was able to get treated, who had bad outcomes. Um and so it's really a um, you know, nobody can uh, ignore uh, this issue anymore because COVID nineteen brought it right to our television sets every night. You know, and, and uh, COVID nineteen is really you know it's the context for so much uh, of what's going on right now. And um, the thing that makes me sad is like where where were our missed opportunities and uh, what what have we not learned from this whole situation? And so um, there are definitely things we have learned. And so that that health equity tracker is a great example of how you can show um, the disparities today in real time. Go look at zip codes. Go look at addresses. Go look in your own city and neighborhood and and verify these these that data with your own eyes. Um, and because we know it's happening and we know that those things I exist. You know, um, we're not going to be able to have time in, in this discussion uh, to go into what we learned from COVID-19, but we should have that conversation sometime uh, uh, because uh, things that we thought that were real tools that were going to help us 
were abandoned early on or proved not to work. Just the, even the issues of contact tracing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, by the time they even had that up and running, the virus was out running the ability to track it. Uh, and then the data that was reported was, uh, it, it was really lost in the mist. It was fuzzy data. We, you know, the, the public health, uh, uh, during that time and still to some a certain degree, uh, was really flying blind and, and trying to come up with policies without all the data. You know, there was really no national repository of who received vaccinations. There, that's still not. You know, a big database that tells us all that kind of stuff. But, but, but that's for, um, another time. Um, you mentioned a, um, conference or connectathon later this month. Tell, tell me more about that. Sure. So, um, you know, I mentioned in my day job standards mm -hmm. development, implementation, and adoption. A key uh, part of that effort is supporting the standards community in helping to um, develop, implement solutions based on the standards and implementation guidance we develop. And so, um, a lot of that activity happens at uh, events called the Connectathon. Um, HL7 runs fire connectathons. IHE Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise runs uh, their connectathons. In September, we're, we're host September 12th through 16th, um, IHE International, um, along with IHE USA and Europe, are hosting what we're calling the first joint connectathon as folks uh, uh, test in Europe, in Montreux, Switzerland, and in North America, in good old Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and uh, we'll be not only testing both, uh, you know, systems from across the pond, but we'll be doing a little bit of state-based uh, testing and interoperability between uh, folks in Georgia and the Hims, Michigan chapter um, that are doing a similar connect-a-thon. And uh, as part of that event, um, it's about five days of 100 or so vendors, medical device manufacturers, HIEs, EHRs, uh, working on interoperability testing. Um, but as part of uh, our, our um, expansion of that event, we're, we're adding some other interoperability testing activities to support things like e-consent, maternal mm. and child health interoperability, um, uh, the granular privacy protections and, and public health modernization as well. So um, we know that implementing health IT is not a one and done activity um, and folks all over the, the ecosystem need different levels of support, whether you're a huge health system, a solo doc practice, a startup, EHR vendor or uh, running, you know, medical device manufacturing. And so the Connectathon gives folks an opportunity to, to join in at the ground level, um, be in a non-competitive but engineering and solution uh, seeking environment where folks that may normally be competitors are collaborating to improve interoperability because you know that interoperability is not um, um, solvable by just one party or even just by the two parties at either end of the exchange. Uh, you know, it takes a village. I take it uh, this is going to be a um, uh, in person as well as somewhat of a uh, virtual connectathon because it's happening in different places. But like, are you actually going to be in Atlanta or are there going to be folks in Atlanta? Uh, yeah, so yeah. after um, a, a, a slight pause where we went completely virtual last year, we are finally back in person and face to face. But that, like you said, um, I think one lesson learned from COVID is that um, we're always going to be supporting folks to participate um, in a hybrid environment because not everyone can be there face to face. And that's also part of that whole health equity and disparity question, uh, making sure that you open up access for folks um, to be present from wherever they are. And, and that's actually something we've tried to do in terms of increasing um, access and opportunities for folks to participate in these events from low middle income countries and via scholarships as well. You know, the um, aspect of COVID-19 and the technologies that were brought to bear, telehealth and things like that, that actually increase the digital divide. But on the other side of the coin is um, it really helped uh, bring to the surface these issues of healthcare uh, inequity. Um, and so uh, I guess it, it was a curse and a blessing because if, if it wasn't so obvious 
uh, that the playing field is not level in, in terms of healthcare access in, in different ways, uh, you and I might not be having this conversation today. Yeah, you know, I mean, for me, I look at it as a game changer for the industry. Um, this was when digital health kind of became in the purview of the general population. Uh, we used to, um, you know, cynically joke that every family now had to appoint their own medical director, right, right. as part of COVID. You needed to figure out what's safe, who was exposed, how to uh, mediate that, um, keep track of vaccines and boosters and everything else. And so um, how is that done now? If you have the tools, it's digitally. Um, if you don't, again, you're left out. And so, um, like you said, COVID has exposed the cracks um, in our infrastructure, in our public health, and how we, we support um, the, um, the folks that have the least in, in our population. And, um, you know, those um, inequities have only been exacerbated. So I'm hoping that now that we have made it some of that obvious, we can make, you know, we can have some action and some improvements in those areas. And again, this is why I think it's important to, to bring these issues up in topics like standards development, product development, um, algorithm development, mm -hmm. you know, at those foundational levels, because it starts at the beginning, uh, making sure that we have the right perspectives, the right voices, um, the right folks at the table to help us not only build, but evolve, modernize, and update, you know, the tools and technologies we're using. I mean, that is a perfect uh, way to end this. Uh, I appreciate that final comment to our audience. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Tate Chronicles. And I, of course, offer a special salute to my guest today, Amit Trivedi. Amit, thanks for coming aboard today. It's my pleasure, and I look forward to chatting again soon. You can find more information on this show's program page at healthcarenowradio.com. Until we meet again, here's wishing you smooth sailing and safe harbors. Tate Chronicles transmission ending now.